if six years ago somebody told me I would be standing on a stage and would be giving a talk to all of you, I would not have believed them. But yet here I am. So why should you listen to me? First of all, let me introduce myself. This is me. Uh, I'm born in 2000 and I'm a digital native. And at this point in my life, I've given more TED Talks or organized a TED event than any other person in this room. It all started off with TEDx Kids in Brussels in 2010. Then a few years later, we organized TEDx Youth at Flanders with my dad. And then in 2015, or beginning of 16, I gave a talk at TEDx Vilnius. Um, this was that little kid who got inspired at TEDx Kids in Brussels. I was just walking around, uh, minding my own business, and got interested in technology and 3D printing. I organized TEDx uh, Youth with my dad, and it all started off with this little inspiration uh, back in 2010. And as I said, in 2010, I got inspired by 3D printing, and it was kind of weird because we had this assignment the day before, and we had to design something in 3D. And I had to start wearing glasses, and I didn't really like them in the shop, so I decided to design my own. And they were quite weird because they had my name written on top of them with like really huge letters. And they were quite Lego-like, so you couldn't really wear them. But yet, a 10-year-old kid who designs his own glasses is quite inspirational, apparently. And these glasses got mentioned in a TED Talk and also exhibited at the Museum of Modern Arts in Antwerp. Then later on, my dad even bought us a printer because I was still interested in all of this, and I wanted to pursue it further and further. So I designed more, I started modeling. But the thing was, back then, there weren't any courses online to actually learn 3D modeling, especially not as a 10-year-old kid. So I decided to learn by myself, and my dad helped me remove hurdles. Along the way, I wanted to learn more about this and what is being done. So my dad took me to the States, and we started meeting a lot of people a lot of pioneers in this industry. Um, that's Scott Summit. He designs 3D printable prosthetics. That over there is the ex-co-founder of MakerBot. That's one of the biggest 3D printer makers in the world. Over there is Lee Vizquera. We met him at a maker's fair at Antwerp. Uh, this is Peter Diamandis. This is Bram de Zwart. And over there, we have Jason Lopes. And the funny thing is that um, I met Jason Lopes back in 2012, I think. And I told him I would give him a pair of glasses once if I had the skills to design these. And then in 2014, I got to hear that I, had, I was going to meet him again. So I thought back at 2012 and remembered that I had to design a pair of glasses. And my design skills weren't that on point yet because of the bendable sticks and all of that. So I kind of still made him a pair of glasses, but the thing was that I used pencils as sticks, so they were quite original, and I didn't have the problem with the, glass, uh, with the sticks and stuff. So as I said, in two uh, I gave a few TED Talks that Ian now mentioned, and uh, it all started with TEDx Kids in, uh, no, TEDx Youths at Flanders back in 2012. And I wanted to inspire more kids with this because I was that one weird 12-year-old kid who was doing 3D printing and nobody actually understood me. So I started explaining this to more and more people. So that was 2012. Then in 2013, I gave one at TEDx Flanders, so the event for the adults. And then 2016, the beginning, I gave a talk at TEDx Vilnius. And this was all to inspire other kids and get them up and coming with the 3D printing. And this got me a lot of media attention. I appeared on newspapers, on TV, and the radio, and this was great because it also got more kids interested because they saw that one 12-year-old kid on TV was doing something with glasses and 3D printers. And I still get, like, uh, in school, a lot of kids come to me and they ask me, were you that one kid with the glasses and the 3D printer on the TV? And I was like, mm, yes, I actually am, because it's like they know me for that moment. Then I got all these kids inspired, but they didn't have anywhere to go with their interests. So I started giving workshops to these kids to actually teach them what they can do with this. And 
um, by giving these workshops, I learned more than I would have without. Because all these kids and all these adults started asking me questions. And a lot of those questions I knew the answers to. But some of them were quite hard to answer. And that actually got me thinking. I learned a lot that way. And during this journey, I learned four core skills. And those are my A, B, C, and Ds. A stands for an analytical approach. This means that you start off with an idea and you get to you go to implementation. And learning these steps is something I did during this process of five years. B stands for balance, and this is a balance between school, play, and passion. I had three main things, my schoolwork, my interest for 3D printing, and my passion being football. And I tried to balance these three equally during the school year, so I, if I overachieved at school, I did more for my hobbies, or if I got bored of my hobbies, I started doing more for 3D or, or in that way. Then you have critical thinking, and that means that you start questioning a lot of things. So you don't just learn like, oh, they told me that, so that's true, but you start questioning this and you uh, start looking at better ways to do this. Because in the 3D printing field, I got to know that a lot of people who are doing certain things for a long time, they keep on doing this. They don't want to change. And as we know, technology gets better and better, and that there are more efficient ways to do this. So the ways of the past aren't necessarily the best ways. And then you have design thinking, and that's the thing that you start off with a problem, you find a solution, you make a prototype, and then you validate. But you don't validate against your solution, but you validate against the problem you had in the beginning. And these four skills I had helped me with everything, be it at school or be it at hackathons or startup weekends, where I wasn't only part a participant, but also got to, make, uh, to be a jury and a mentor. And I kind of got bored of 3D printing after five years. And the thing was that when I went to the States with my dad, I got exposed to a lot of things like synthetic biology and spa uh, space exploration. So I wanted to pursue those two careers. So I started off as an amateur again. But this time, I took a different approach at things. For the space events, we started going to more and more big events in other countries. So the big, uh, important one was uh, Disrupt Space in Bremen. And over there, the idea was quite simple. You go there, you pick a challenge, you find your solution, and then you pitch your solution to all the people in the room. And I went there with my dad and my friend Kevin, and he has an Instagram page on space, and he's quite into all of this. So we went there, and we were the only two youngsters over there. And we saw that we had a completely different look at things than the people who are already in this industry. So the people who work in this industry had a certain way of looking at things, and they didn't want to change this. And we had a different uh, perspective of this, and this got me quite uh, thinking about the allegory of Plateau. And we also started uh, organizing more and more events like this, but in smaller scales, to get more kids and people interested in space. So we organized Space Apps Challenge in Brussels in 2016. And we saw that kids had quite a problem with going further with this technology, because they didn't have a base of knowledge. And I believe schools for this, because they should teach a certain base of space knowledge, I guess, that kids know what they're getting themselves into if they follow a career in space studies or if they start working in this industry. And we also saw that these events, um, you don't need a background in space to do something with it. And second, we had this interest for biology. And we pursued this by organizing if, uh, workshops with the open community lab in Ghent called Reagent. And that's a lab for enthusiasts and hobbyists who want to work on their biology project, project. And we're working on making workshops for them to actually teach kids and show them that the biology they're learning in schools right now isn't the same biology that they're going to get later on. In schools, they're learning how to classify leaves, while right now they actually are doing more with design and with coding and making cars out of material like bones and furniture out of mushrooms and all of that. And that project is called E. coli. 
And we're also looking at making, uh, putting together a high school iGEM team, and we have everything in place except for benefactors or sponsors. And during this journey with um, biology and space, I experienced a lot of problems that were same to 3D printing. And the thing was that organizations don't see what is coming up, and they don't want to change. And it's hard for a, like a 16-year-old kid to kind of convince them. So I got frustrated by seeing a future and not getting, uh, like, not being able to get it quickly. Um, <laughs> I learned a lot of things during this journey, and the main things I want to do right now is teach others what I learned and to make sure that the present youth make a great future. And the first thing I saw is that they needed a poster boy. They needed someone who can show them the relevance of things, and I was this for 3D printing in Belgium at least. Uh, a lot of kids looked up to me, and I kind of used this opportunity to also promote a charity, charity called Eyes for the World. And they bring eyewear to uh, kids in third world countries who can't afford them, so it kind of got like along with my interest for eyewear. Secondly, I saw that you need to surround yourself by people who are also willing to help you further. If I pitched an idea here in Belgium or in Europe, I often got the, uh, the response that it was a nice story and I wouldn't get anywhere with it. If I pitch the same idea in the States, I get the response that people want to help me. They want to ask how they can, what they can do for me and how, they, how I can reach my goal. And that's the kind of people you need to surround yourself with. People who help you achieve your wildest dreams. I also saw that schools will need to change. Um, teachers aren't always the person who know the most in a classroom. For example, my friend Kevin, he's really into space, as I said, and everything he knows about it, he learned by himself, via the internet or via uh, books or whatever. And teachers don't know this, but he teaches other kids who are also interested in space about, uh, about space with his own knowledge, and it gets him further than the studies he gets in school. I also saw that schools need to, cheat, need to teach three main uh, skills. Uh, the analytical approach, critical thinking, and design thinking. The analytical approach being that kids need to define a certain problem. Um, finding the solution is the easy part, because uh, if you put it in a math mathematical equation, you start off with a problem, you then later on put this problem into a mathematical model, and then the computer can generate the most optimal solution. This can be done by machi machine learning, etc. But the thing is that you need to be able to define this problem. And kids these days aren't that good at it. If Henry, uh, Henry Ford once asked people, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And this is the same problem we're finding right now. People need to be able to ask the right questions and write, uh, find the problem instead of making a stupid solution. Schools will need to go from hierarchies to networks because students, they'll need to come and they'll come with their ideas to the schools. Teachers, uh, teachers will act as a person who helps them remove hurdles. And the schools will act as an accelerator for their idea. And there they'll learn the steps from an idea to implementation. And the thing is that they, right now, a lot of kids get, t uh, get taught a technology. They then get to know what the solutions are they can make with this technology, and then they're told to market the solution. So then they just show people that they have a problem, and they tell them that their technology is their solution. But this is the wrong way to do things. They need to show them, they need to find the problem, then later on uh, make a solution for this, and then design technology to uh, help fix the problem. I also saw that schools will need, uh, there will need to be a platform for all these kids to get in contact with experts. And this will need to be a safe and secure place because there will be kids involved and all of this knowledge needs to be handed over correctly. And <laughs> to conclude all of this, I'm sure that you guys saw a 16-year-old come on stage and thought, how could he have enough knowledge to give three TED Talks? 
Well, I hope you don't judge the youths by their, uh, by their age, but rather by their capabilities and help them reach their full potential. Thank you.